Thank you. It's been a pleasure to be here this morning at the Beverly Library and talk about a place so far away. One of the many gifts in my life has been my relationship with Pakistan. I lived in Singapore and in Singapore there were flights that were six hours away to Pakistan. And Pakistan has everything Singapore doesn't have. It has history, politics, humor, chaos, freedom. They're a great contrast. Plus, I started playing polo there. And the British military discovered polo in northern India, what is now Pakistan. And I was friends with a lot of polo players, and I was playing, and so they all invited me to play. So in 1993 was my first visit to Pakistan. Is it loud? OK. Better? So, yes, it's a very photogenic place. The other thing about Pakistan is, is it working? No. Now it's going off. Now it's, is that better? Yeah. Pakistan and Afghanistan are situated on the Silk Road, which leaves it to a lot of invaders and a lot of politics. And what our, where we're living today is directly involved in the politics that happened in Afghanistan and Pakistan for decades. Both the Soviet Union and the United States were heavily involved in Afghanistan and Pakistan. For, as we know, what happened was three countries went together to fight, to make an army to fight for God against the Russians. Remember in the Cold War, it's the Russians have no God, so we can defeat them through religion. And when you create a, an army to fight for God, you circumvent cultures and, and nationalities you find all the people of a common religion, bring them together and tell them if you fight for God, you're going to go to heaven. And they'll do just about anything, as we have seen. Um, billions of dollars were spent creating this war. It's very upsetting the more you know about it. And what happens when you are one of those people that was raised in a war? Um, and you're the children of the people raised in the war. And what did happen was schools were actually invented to indoctrinate children, boys mostly. They're called madrasas. Um, they're supposed to be religious centers, but these were used as propaganda machines by the Soviets and the Pakistanis and the Americans. And very often, the teachers in these schools were demented, and they actually preyed on the children. And so what would happen if a child grew up in this kind of chaos? Um, literally, it's child trafficking. They indoctrinate children, and they tell them, if they blow themselves up, they'll go to heaven. And this is child trafficking. It is not religion. So why am I talking about Afghanistan and the war in Afghanistan when we're talking about Pakistan? Because the border, if you see that dark green line, it's called the Durand Line. The British were never defeated. In all the years of the British Raj, they were never defeated. Um, they, they never defeated the Afghans. So they decided, well, we'll draw a line here so maybe we can divide and conquer the Pashtu. The green area are the people of the Pashtu uh, clan, and they are very proud of themselves, and they're very determined, and they don't want to be ruled by anybody, and they never have. So this line between Afghanistan and Pakistan is not really there. It's just on the map. So that's another reason the two countries suffer the same fate. And the people there are just like us. They just want to be happy. They want their children to be safe. They want to have um, a good future. And they are really serious about hospitality. When I'm there, just about anything I want to do, they want to show me how to do it. So I, this kid was driving a donkey. I said, can I do that? And they said, sure. So I have a really good time when I go there. Another misconception about Pakistan and Afghanistan is that um, women have no rights. But as we know, women's rights is all about education. These women are all personal friends of mine, and they're all very well educated. The two younger ones on the right are now university uh, educated, and the other three, uh, the three in the middle, I play polo with their husbands, and I know them very well, and I can tell you all their men are afraid of them. They have every right that we do in their town, their village, in their community. And what, another thing about Pakistan is it's, it's got Rotary. Rotary is a huge club of people all over the world. Right now I'm in Beverly Rotary. <laughs> And these people meet once a week to try to think of how to make the community and the world a better place. So I networked with Rotary, and the Rotary does huge things. Um, 
Their international philosophy is that they will work on international understanding, goodwill, and peace. They strive to plan a better future for children throughout the world. And they know chaos anywhere affects us everywhere. And we also know that too. We are all one. We are a global community. And all the years I was going to Af Pakistan, they're all telling me it's about education, it's about education. So when I met Rotary, I realized how easy it was to help with education because they all had schools. This school, the gentleman on the far end with a brown jacket, he's the president of Rawalpindi Rotary, and this school is in his backyard. So I said, great, how can I help? So we never went out of ways to help. Rotary actually gives grants for many, many things, including education, and they're working on eliminating polio from the world. They're almost there. They just have Afghanistan and Pakistan. Although wherever there's chaos, polio rears its ugly head, like it, it resurfaced in Syria, but they did manage to eliminate it again. So I inherited all these friends. These are some of my really good friends. And there's a thing about smiling for pictures in Pakistan. You see a lot of really fierce pictures of people from Pakistan in the paper, and they really look mean. And so that really, I, and usually they're smiling. So I was sitting with my friends for a picture, and I said, and, and they, said, they said, please smile so no one thinks that we're holding you captive. So, so I said, no, you smile so that they don't think you're Taliban. So I got this great picture. But even the nicest person can look pretty fierce with a certain look on their face. But when they act normal, when the, when the people smile a lot, then you can tell how friendly they are. These men, it, this took me 10 years to get these pictures because <laughs> these are all men that I worked with very closely on schools, mostly for girls. And every one of them wants their children and other people's children and girls educated. They work, they spend their whole life, their property, their money, their parents' property to help with education. And I've never really met anybody that didn't want their children educated. They didn't want um, their children to travel far, especially the girls in case they got kidnapped. Um, they want to protect them from the security situation has been pretty bad there. So, you know, they want to they wanna be careful how they do it, but they all want their children educated because they know that that's how you change society. That's how you civilize society. And, of course, I needed a good Rotary partner because in Rotary, every single dollar, every rupee has to be accounted for. That's why it's such a great system. So I found um, this partner, Zab Shah, because I really wanted to work up north where the most chaos was. I didn't want to work in Islamabad or Lahore, the big cities. I wanted to work where the worst chaos was. So Zam Shah has taken me around for years to the different schools. This was one of the schools, this was in 2003. This school had nothing. And it's, it's a, it was a little uh, government school next to a farmer's farm and where they grew uh, sugar cane and various crops to keep their family and their uh, livestock alive. And we did grants for this school we, in, every couple years we did another grant. Beverly Rotary contributed to this grant. Um, every time I spoke to them, they'd give me $1,000. So they were really deeply involved in these projects. So this Kalusha school now has a girls college, the only one in the area. And we have also early learning center. Um, and we just, Ian and I have just come back from visiting the final uh, visit for the report for this project. Um, I had done projects, many projects up there before, and this man, Mr. Christian Brun, who is a part of a Rotary Club in Denmark, was Googling helping women in Pakistan, and he found me, and he sent me an email. He said, what can I do? So I gave him a list. So this is what he wanted to do. So this was with a Rotary Club in Denmark. We got them uh, all kinds of furniture, school buses, and um, solar panels, because there's no grid up there anymore. The British built it, and it was never really kept up. So. So this is our first graduating class. All these girls went to further education, and one of them is actually in China in medical school. So we are gonna make a female doctor for that village. We are raising an entire generation of Malalas. Do you know about Malala? Yes. We have lots of them, but they don't make speeches in public, but they, they do in private. So whenever I've gone there, I always say I'm an American, and I'm always warmly welcomed and everybody wants to meet me, and like I said, I've never met anybody that didn't want their girls educated. And what you hear, none of this is really about religion. It's about religion being used as leverage over people that are ignorant and desperate. And it's a one huge propaganda machine. It's very sad. Things are getting much better there. They now have a new government. Actually, this man that just won the election last year, 
You heard a lot about it here, I think. I, I was cer certainly following it. He was a cricketer, he was a, a sports personality, and, but known to not be corrupt and to be a huge philanthropist. And he had been in politics and he actually ran the Northwest Frontier Province where the schools are for the last four years. His, got, his party ran it and now they have peace. After decades and decades of war, there's peace and tranquility and things are growing again and people are walking around. So we know what this man can do. So everybody is very excited. Yes, Pakistan is a mess. He's got a lot of work to do, but he is honest and he is trying his hardest. And there is a bright future for Pakistan coming up. So that is my talk about why we're there and what we're doing. And we're, I'm going to turn it over to Ian to tell you more about the uh, geography and the history and the politics and the art. Thank you. I'm Ian Goddard. And uh, I had many years ago been to India. I'd never been to Pakistan. This was a chance of a lifetime when Rachel took me and introduced me to all her friends and they, and they took us all over the country and um, it was really stupendous. I, I can't wait to go back again. So, so here's the subcontinent of India and Pakistan over on the left and I love laser pointers. Here's Pakistan on the on the uh, west side and Bangladesh, which used to be East Pakistan, which used to be uh, East Bengal on the east side, and India all in the middle. Our travels in Pakistan took us from Lahore, uh, which is one of the biggest cities. Uh, which is near the border with India, it's right along here, over to Peshawar, which is right near the border with Afghanistan. So essentially from one side of the country to the other. Um, to begin with, we took a long flight to Dubai and changed flights for Lahore. This is sort of the overview of our trip, right? Um, we took a, after a few days in Lahore, we took a coach to Islamabad, which is the capital of the country, because we were going to a rotary conference there. Then friends took us to their home in Peshawar, <coughs> from where we re visited Rachel's Kalu Shah school that she showed you pictures of. And then a hired car took us to the ruins at Taxila and on to a friend's estate near Sargoda. And finally a car took us to Lahore, which was our last stop. So our first day was really long. After the 16 hour flight, we got to bed at 3 a.m. and we were picked up at 7 a.m. to go visit um, the, rot the rotary sponsored school at Kujur village. It's in the neighborhood of Lahore. Uh, this is our friend Shazad Ahmed. And uh, he had uh, three other American Rotarians with us, um, as well as uh, members of his own Rotary Club. So we were with uh, Lon and Helen Penna, who actually began the Rotary's programs at Kujur Village, and the international representative uh, Karen Babin. So we drove from Lahore to the village in cars, not in a horse, um, and we were met by an honor guard um, and a marching band. We proceeded into the village and we were welcomed by dancing horses and friendly villagers and garlands and rose petals. And let's see if we can bring this off. Nope, have to do it manually, that's fine. Um, so it took a long time to proceed into the village because there were always more villagers and and more music and um, rose petals and and more dancing horses and and it at the end it was really tiring but worth it so 
uh, finally we were just standing on, on a whole carpet of rose petals. We went to the boys' school, and at the boys' school, um, Shazad conducted some uh, polio awareness uh, classes, and, and we had photo ops and an assembly with the students. And then we proceeded to the girls' school, which is next door. And there were more lessons and assemblies and photo opportunities. When the kids were dismissed for the day, we inspected one of the buffalo that Rotary had donated to the village. And of course, the evidence of the Rotary uh, anti-polio campaign was uh, everywhere. We ended up at the local library and computer center, which is in the home of Rotarian Bali Malik. Then we visited some other Rotary clubs in the evening, and at last our honor guard said goodbye with hugs and high fives. As Rachel said, you mustn't smile if you're in a picture. But all the rest of the time they did. Um, in Lahore, we were staying with friends Sidra Minhas and her husband Zahir and family. Um, I had really wanted to go to the Lahore Museum, which is where Rudyard Kipling's father was the curator. This is uh, the old Lahore Museum, and this is the new building, uh, you know, new in terms of the British Raj. Um, and um, Mm -hmm. Right, and uh, yes, so we went through a metal detector at the entrance, just like at the Smithsonian, and inside the museum is full of beautiful Pakistani arts and crafts and architecture. It's uh, really had a wonderful afternoon there. One of the treasures is the the famous Fasting Buddha statue from Taxila, where we were to go later. And when we left, and the guards found out that we were American, they insisted on a photo and gave us big hugs and big smiles. Well, not in the picture, but... Uh, <laughs> but they were, they were really hospitable. So, the first page of Kipling's novel, Kim, begins at the famous canon Kim's Gun, which is right outside the Lahore Museum. Um, so I needed to see that. I tried to take a selfie, but it got photobombed by a, a push-to gentleman, which, after the, after the picture was taken, was all smiles and handshakes and so on. The day after that was Friday, and we wanted to see the old walled city of Lahore, so our driver took us to the Delhi gate of the old bald city, but he had some trouble getting there because it's very confusing in the old town. But at last we got parked and started walking through the bazaar. Which is a, a really interesting and cool place. We didn't have time to stop and look at everything because we had to hurry a little bit uh, so that we would get to the mosque before Friday prayers began. No end of neat stuff to look at. Yes. Um, what did it feel like there? Was it hot? Was it? What did it smell like? I'd like to get a feeling of yeah. the atmosphere. Uh, we went at this time of year, and it wasn't hot yet. It was like high 80s and low 90s. But it did, after many days, get to kind of wearing us down. Um, a lot of dust, as you might expect. 
Um, in fact, the, the first day when we went to Kujur village, there was a big dust storm. I'd never been in a dust storm like that, but um, so it, it was humid. it was denser than fog. You couldn't you couldn't see where you were driving. So it wasn't humid. No, I don't recall it being humid at that season. And what did it smell like? Did you smell all the foods and was they, were things cooking? Uh, yes, I, uh, I'm a great fan of Indian food and so of course the thing that I had not anticipated, which I should have anticipated, is that it's, as Rachel was showing you on the cultural map, it's all the same country and culture, and so Pakistani food is just Indian food with meat in it. <laughs> and was it so, noisy? Uh, it, it was noisy and chaotic, and 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 lots of uh, motorcycles and scooters rushing around and so on. But um, uh, I don't I don't recall you know, being assailed by stenches and open sewers and stuff. It, uh, it, it, wasn't, uh, it, it wasn't a Western European country, but it wasn't, um, it wasn't filthy. It was just did chaotic. It, did it have a feeling of festivity while you were there? Sorry, a feeling did of what? Feel uh, <coughs> I, I wouldn't have described it that way. But um, so when I went to India, it was 1982. That's a long time ago, in a sense, or in the sense of Indian history, it's no time at all. Um, and in the north of India, like bordering Pakistan, uh, I generally had the sense of desperation. Um, Desperation to survive, desperation to get into the front of the line, desperation to get the best price, just always striving and, and anxiety. And in 2018 in Pakistan, I did not feel that. I don't know whether it's elapsed time, different culture, different predominant religion, what it is, um, but it felt different. Um, at any rate, we did get to the mosque before prayers. Um, this is the uh, Wazir Khan Mosque, built by Emperor Shah Jahan, who, if you're really up on your Middle Eastern history, he was the guy who built the Taj Mahal. So everywhere you look, there's gorgeous artwork. And at one point, a local man um, had stopped us and was giving me a lesson on comparative religions and why God wants Muslims, Jews, and Christians to all live in peace together. That night, we went back to the old city with Sidra and her extended family for a nighttime tour of the old Lahore fort and palace. There were costumed entertainers. And the remarkable Hall of Mirrors. Um, it looks a little shiny in the picture, but uh, when you're there, it's really, really shiny. All of, all of the little mosaics are made out of mirrors. At one point in the evening, uh, we had a music and dancing performance accompanied by uh, apparently the emperor and his wives. <coughs> Next, we went on to the Pakistan-Afghanistan <coughs> Rotary Conference in Islamabad. There was a little entertainment and a series of talks, but mostly there was time to meet new friends and fellow Rotarians and have a lot of photo opportunities. Then Sunday afternoon, doctors Mansoor and Sultana drove us to their home in Peshawar. On the way, they were very obliging and they stopped for me at the Indus River, 
Uh, I remembered from fifth grade geography that Indus River is where civilization began, so that was very cool. <clears throat> Monday, Dr. Mansour took us to the Kalu Shah School that Rachel mentioned before. The owner um, of the farm, Islam Khan, greeted us with a traditional rose petal welcome. Um, and because Rachel is quite a VIP there, having worked for the school for so many years, there was a, a really elaborate welcome ceremony. There were some nice welcome dances. And an award ceremony for the students where we all got to present different awards. Some boys sang a song that they had written. And Rachel gave a short speech. They gave us a nice luncheon, and Rachel got to visit with Islam Khan's family. Also, while we were in Peshawar, members of the local Rotary Club filled up our spare time, mostly by taking us out to eat. So Wednesday, a car and driver took us to the historical sites at Taxila, which is an ancient city on the Silk Road. It had a large Buddhist college and several ancient city sites. The, they told us that um, the, uh, the Apostle Thomas, Doubting Thomas, visited there. In the garden of the excellent little museum, a young Pakistani man rushed after us and wanted to take a selfie with me. Clearly, I was a foreign visitor. Then the driver took us onward to Sargoda, where Rachel's friend Azim Noon lives on his hereditary estate and has really cool slippers. <laughs> We were showered with hospitality and great food, and he toured us around his farm and lovely gardens, which were filled with exotic pets. Thursday, we were driven back to Lahore where we stayed with I.K. and O.B. Kahwani. I.K. has worked as a political advisor in Imran Khan's recent presidential campaign that Rachel was showing you the pictures of, and he is the great-grandson of an actual nabob, the Nawab Ahmad Yar Khan Kahwani. You can see the family resemblance. <laughs> Um, Friday, our friend Sidra Minhas took us to a school in Kasur village, also near Lahore, uh, that her foundation is supporting. The school was started for the children of poor brickmakers in the area in a private home. And this is uh, the family of, that owns the home and the school. So we had the rose petal welcome. Then we had the welcome dance. We had a tour of the school and its two classrooms, which had taken over the family's house. The family moved upstairs to make room for the school rooms. The school serves boys and girls of all ages. Rachel helped in an English lesson. They'll never be the same. <laughs> and the children did some presentations. 
Let's see if I can make this happen. So the, the children all gathered for dismissal exercises. And set off for home. Back in Lahore, we visited numerous friends such as Sheikh Parvez and his family, and Sidra's extended family, and finally boarded the plane for home. So. Isn't Pakistan dangerous? Well, everywhere we went, we were welcomed. Most of the time, we were treated like visiting VIPs, by people who only knew that we were foreign guests in their country and wanted to share their beautiful culture with us. In fact, the only times we encountered people frustrated with us was when we did not have time to accept their hospitality. And we saw that all over the country, just plain folks are donating land and buildings to build schools for their children, both boys and girls, because they know that education supports a civil society and peace. So I think that opens our program for questions. Yes. Earlier, actually towards the end, you showed a picture of a series of low stone walls and somewhat of a grid pattern that you said there was a college there at one point. What was, what was the meaning of those walls? I'll get there. Okay. <coughs> there. Okay. Um, that is the w one of the several cities over the over the course of time at uh, Taxila. The Silk Road that used to run from the farthest east regions of China to basically the Black Sea, um, passed fairly near this, but there was a branch, like Highway 290 or something, that, that came down to Taxila. And so uh, this is part of the Buddhist college. Uh, this was a trading city. And all of the uh, various artifacts that they've dug up from both the, the college and the city and uh, different architecture are all in this little museum. My question is for you, Rachel. In many of the pictures, you've got your hair covered, but not in all of them. So what determined when you were covering and when you were... <laughs> Good question. Um, it, usually when I'm in Lahore, the big city, or in Islamabad, I don't really worry about it. And it's a, it's. Can you hear me? And it, it's it's hard to learn how to wear one of those, and it depends on the fabric. Some fabric sticks to itself, and you can wear it. And, but if it doesn't, you're constantly messing with it if you're not used to it. So, but then I had this chiffon thing that was kind of sticky, but I put my purse on it or something. And when I was at the schools or when I was out in the countryside, I usually would cover my head because I don't have to. But I would just assume if I didn't cover my head, um, I have a boy cut. They call this a boy cut. So if you have your hair cut short, you have a boy cut, you're probably a foreigner, which is fine, but I just want to blend in. Previously, it would be if you're a foreigner, the police will stop you and check your ID and your permit to be where, you're, where you are, which I never have. 
So I would always cover my head and my face just for the police. But now it's quite peaceful there, so I don't need to do it. But it, it's sort of like, yeah, blending in. I don't have to cover my head, but I'd like to blend in. And, it, and it's sort of, even, even um, the, when you wear a short sleeve, they call that the half sleeve, which is okay in the big cities, but if you have a half sleeve, they stare at your arms and you just feel like you're attracting attention. So I wouldn't be mobbed or arrested or hassled, but I just like to blend in. So it's really up to me. And even in Lahore, like the, the smaller ones are called dubattas. And one time I, and to match the dubattas with the clothes is a real pain. I mean, it's, so I don't have a dubatta for this, but I can't, I, and they're, they're saying, no, you don't have to wear one. It's okay, half the women in the big cities don't wear one. So, you know, but if you go way up north into the villages outside of Peshawar, or, or even in the city of Peshawar, I usually cover my head because I just don't want to attract attention. Yeah, good question. I don't have to, but I like to. Uh, Marco Polo uh, traveled the Silk Road around the 1500s. Do you know if he got into this area? Um. Marco Polo went back and forth. I do not think that he went to Taxila. I'm sure they would have told us if he had. Although, I went to Venice and it was really hard to find anything about Marco Polo. I was offended by that. Um, uh, yeah, I think, um, I seem to recall that one time he, he was sort of traveling by water, but um, one other direction, he probably just took the main road and didn't take the little detour. I'm guessing and making it up a little bit because I don't know. But uh, it would be cool to, to really see a map of that and, and what's there now. The one they all talk about is Alexander the Great and Sikandar. Sikandar or Iskandar is actually their version of Alexander the Great. So he did travel there. I know. <laughs> well, I lived in Singapore and I, I teach exercise and I, I was like the first personal trainer in Pakistan and I, I was, I started riding at the polo club and the owner was a Muslim Indian and his wife came from Pakistan. So I got to know her and I became the personal trainer for the Singapore Pakistani Women's Association. And because we had so many polo players from Pakistan, everybody kept inviting, you know, come, Bring, bring some other women friends and we'll arrange polo for you. And, and polo is like a drug, like, oh yeah, I'm on my way. <laughs> and I had to find somebody to go with me that was a decent player that was female. And even she tried to jam out at the last minute because in Singapore everybody works all the time, but she did go. And then from there, I, you know, once they got to know me, like if you come alone, it's kind of weird. They, you know, but if you come with friends, it's better. But after the first visit, they just said, just come by yourself. So eventually, <laughs> I had my own horses there, and I would commute. I had I would go there and play full polo for three months a year. Uh, in April, October, December, and April, I would play polo there. So I had this huge network of friends, and and then I moved back here right before 9/11, and I'm like I'm hearing this hateful speech about my friend's country. So I and I kept well, September 28th, 2001. I just happened to be sponsored to go and play in a women's tournament. And people are saying, surely you're not going now. And I'm like, surely I am. And of course, it was really amazing to be there at that time. I was, it was, I, at the time, I didn't think about it. But I look back on it. It was a wonderful trip. And you know, I was like an ambassador of sanity, although it didn't really help. But <laughs> I thought I was helping. So you, you, I just kind of fell in love with this country. And you know, wherever you go, it's about the people. When you meet good people, and there's good people everywhere. but. It just seems like Pakistan is so misunderstood and philanthropy is so huge. Philanthropy is so huge in Pakistan because they know nobody else is going to help. And it's one of the pillars of Islam. Yes, it's one of the pillars of Islam. And, and they know that if they don't help, nobody else is. So if people have money, they will help other people. So, yes. Does that answer? Yeah. Good. You pick one. <sighs> Way in the back. What's the name of your hat? Uh, <laughs> it's, it's actually a, a Perstu winter topi. So we weren't there in the winter, and uh, most of most of uh, where's the white hat? Let me see if I can find one. Where are you? 
You were wearing it then, weren't you? Yeah, I was. Well, I, I no, I actually I was wearing a, a borrowed one. And they went to great lengths to find the right Maybe. hats for him because he expressed interest and they're like... Oh, yeah, we had to go to a hat store and, and our host insisted on buying this. And I said, well, no, I kind of want one of the white ones. And, oh, okay, we'll, we'll get a white one too. <laughs> well, how much was it? No, 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 you can't pay for it. It's a gift. Yeah. So, yeah. Did you, in your travels, encounter any Taliban and um, it, the, the people you did encounter, did they speak of the Taliban at all? Generally, when they speak of the Taliban, they actually speak of thugs. Taliban is like a way to use religion to label a bunch of thugs that are ruining their country. And um, they, call, they might call them the Taliban out of a general term because they don't know what else to call them, but there's certain people's names that they follow that are thugs that are in different areas, like the ones in Sawat where Malala Yousafzai was. They were a certain kind of, they weren't just the Taliban of Afghanistan, they were a certain kind of thugs that had a different name. And um, I guess we weren't around any because actually there's not that many left anymore. The ones that are doing the horrible things now are even rogue Taliban's, they're not even, the Taliban wouldn't want to have anything to do with them. So, so, I mean, in 2001, when I went to Peshawar in September, I was sitting with Taliban. <laughs> but nobody said anything, and we didn't say anything. But um, they exist mostly in Afghanistan. They don't have as much power now as some of the worst people, people that are even worse than them. So. Um, the, the army has sort of taken over the worst areas in Pakistan and they're not such a problem anymore. But the things that do happen, there's some outrageous things that do happen, but they don't really say Taliban about them anymore. So, yeah. Uh, Ian, having been to both India and Pakistan, the same point we did is the animosity between the two countries. Can you speak to that at all? Um. Probably you need an answer from both of us. Uh, I believe that 90% of the problem was the British decreeing that at partition, this half was going to be Muslim and this half was going to be uh, Hindu and everybody was living everywhere. So there was this huge diaspora in both directions and there was so much chaos that there was a lot of violence in the process of that diaspora and people losing their land and stuff because they were going to the other country. Um, and, you know, people with a 5,000 year history have a, have a tendency to maintain animosities for a long time. That's my answer. What's your answer? Oh, I, I, I have lots of answers to that. Um, well, and the other problem is Kashmir. They left Kashmir sort of in limbo. So if there's any animosity between the Pakistanis and the Indians now, it would be about Kashmir because the, the, the army is fighting back and forth. Um, the both governments do use um, animosity between the two countries as a, as a lever, as a way to get power, as, to, as a way to get support. Right now, it's mostly symbolic. Um, where where we are in like Lahore is Punjab, is the Punjab and the the um, line between Pakistan the partition line between Pakistan and India was drawn straight through the Punjab, so they're all related, and it's now been an entire generation, and uh, in Polo they've always played together. The, I mean maybe there was a 20 year gap, but the 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 Polo players have always played from India and Pakistan have always played together. And I was part of a delegation to meet some of the Indian polo players at the border. They didn't get their visas in time, so they couldn't fly. And sometimes they don't have flights between Delhi and Lahore. So we met them at the border, and it was like a big reunion, and the army was there. I mean, it's, it's really only about Kashmir at this point. And, and they realize how the close. Crossing. Oh, yeah. There's a place 40 minutes from Lahore that's called the Wagna border. And it's a. I was never that interested in going, but then the rangers who play polo said, you must come and see our border. And it's, it's like a football game. And every time I go, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Now they have these big grandstands on both sides of the border. And, and they, have, they have cheerleaders. And they take turns cheering. 
And the, and the guards on one side, on the Indian side, and the guards on the Pakistani side, they mirror image each other's marches, and they practice together. So it's, like a, it's, it's literally like a football game. And at, at 4 o'clock, they close the gates. So they do this big thing, closing the gates. And the big, they have the tallest guards you can find, these big, huge, seven feet tall guys marching around with these beards and this stern look. And it's, it's fun. And it's the border. So you know, it's, it's, it's an amazing experience. Any more questions? So but whenever I've been in um, countries or areas with a lot of Muslims, I've been very conscious of the call to prayer five times a day. You didn't mention that. Was that prevalent? Um, it seemed like everybody has their own thing. Some people, you might know it's the call to prayer because they'll go disappear somewhere, or they'll cover their head and they'll pray in place. Sometimes you won't even notice it. It's just, people are of all different degrees of religion there. Um, on Friday, everything's closed, and the men go pray in the mosque. So there's usually a traffic jam. Um, but lots of them don't ever, don't, they pray once, or they don't pray. Or right, well, right now it's fasting month, so you would really be conscious of it now. <laughs> because they don't sleep all night. And, but when you're, when you're there, like, Usually people are just kind of at dusk is when you notice it because you might, you might hear a mosque, you might not, but everybody kind of stops for a minute at dusk and the women cover their head and they just kind of, they're praying, and they're praying quietly, it's like they're meditating. But sometimes you never notice it at all, so um, everybody's different there. And, and the religion is interpreted through the culture, so every country has its own way to interpret the religion. That's another thing, way that it gets misunderstood. People think that every, every uh, Muslim is like a Saudi Arabian Muslim. And you know, there's just all kinds. And in Pakistan, they, there's not as so many laws about it. They might have them. They might not enforce them. They might ignore them. or they, It's chaos, but it's really interesting. <laughs> Any more questions? Yes. Um, I noticed a red um, Bokhara rug in one of the pictures. Is that a part of Pakistan, or is that India? Oh, with, with the shoes? With Azam Khan's shoes? I that one. It was a red rug, and it had little um, almost octagonal diamonds in it. It's called a Bokhara. The, red, the dark, the maroon it with was, black? It, no, it was an all red rug with trim, white and red trim on it. And then in the central part, there were like rows of these um, little octa octagonal things that were oval octagonal. Well, I, I can tell you one thing. Most of the carpets uh, now. No. Are made in Afghanistan, oh. in homes in oh. Afghanistan by women and children, mm -hmm. because that's how you can get the cheapest labor, and at least they do have a job. That is where most of them come from, they, and they give them a. There's a design. They write the design out, mm -hmm. and then they sell it to carpet dealers all over the world. That's but that's where most of them come. They used to. Oh, is that it? Yes. Yes. That's a Bokara. Yes. Yes. That's actually very. Uh, Afghanistan, northern Pakistan and Afghanistan, oh, you see okay. a lot of those. Oh. Yeah, and, and yeah, now they're mostly made in homes in Afghanistan. Oh, I didn't know that. Mine yeah. came from filing space. <laughs> <laughs> yes? Is there much Christianity there, or is it all Muslim? No, 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 there's Christianity there. There's big, beautiful churches everywhere. Actually, one thing that's really interesting is, if the first thing you do when you have money is you put your kid in a private school. <laughs> And if you don't have as much money, you put them in the Catholic schools. So there's tons of fabulous Catholic schools. There's tons of nuns there. And these kids are Muslim kids. But they go to Catholic schools because they're really good schools and they're not that expensive. And, you know, the, and, and look, some of my friends in Rotary there are, are Christians. In fact, the people doing that school in the village are Christians. And when we went mm -hmm. to the roof of their house, remember, there was a mosque on mm -hmm. one side and a church on the other. So there are Christians everywhere. Uh, you know, I just... It's, there has been the weird, the odd, weird, angry, I don't know, Taliban thug or whatever that has done some horrible things to churches there. But there's also a lot of guards that are Muslim and Christian guarding, the, and, and even the army too, guarding those places. So yeah, no, it's, it's come a long way from where it was during partition. And, and um, but the Christians do marry Christians. That's the only thing that seems to be, uh, you know, 
they don't want to convert and and most of the time the muslims don't want to convert the christians either so they just want to live and let live yeah yeah yes so are these rotary schools that you go to are they considered private they're private but they're free to the poorest kids okay. what they do is this this nonprofit that the one the kalusha there's a nonprofit uh, that's actually in Toledo, Ohio, that, that has, it's mostly Pakistani Americans funding. Pakistanis in this country and in, all over the world send tons of money home, tons of money home. And, and so what they do is they, the kids can come for free. If they can afford to pay, they do. And usually like there's a school in Peshawar that the kids can afford to pay a little bit. So then they, they give that extra money up north to like Kalusha. So it, no, they're private schools, but they're free. And there was, there was a huge long waiting list to get in, but now in the north the schools are, the government schools are getting a little better, and also um, the tribal area that we used to do the drone bombings, mm -hmm. that's not happening anymore, and the, the army has taken over, and they're building schools there, so a lot of the tribal people have gone back. Slowly they're going back and believing they might be able to have a life there. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the schools at Rotary Helps are for poor, poor kids, really poor kids. Yeah, good question. I think we've got time for one more, if anybody has one. Or if not. Oh, oh. oh the language? I mean, you got by by speaking English, or did you have translators? Um, yes, it, it varied. Uh, basically, all of the folks like these, or like Rachel's friends, were fluent in English and, and Urdu, which is, I guess, the official national language, and Punjabi, and probably three or four other local languages, Pushtu and so forth. Um, and so Lahore is in Punjab, and and uh, Peshawar is in the, the, the Pushtu region, so like the language at your mother's knee in Peshawar is different <laughs> from in Lahore, but everybody was speaking English. Um, and sometimes more easily and sometimes less easily, and sometimes we would get a driver who would be fluent in English, and sometimes we would get one that was difficult to communicate with. Um, but everybody wanted to communicate. You know, and sometimes just the desire to communicate makes it uh, makes it possible. Yeah. Yeah, and also if they really couldn't communicate, they'd call one of their relatives who could speak English on the phone, and and we'd do it that way. You know, and also Ian's quite a linguist. I speak a little bit of Urdu from being there so much. So yes. Now, do all the schools there now teach English as a second language? The rich people's schools teach English, mm -hmm. but the poor kids' school, like our schools, there's, the teachers don't speak English that well. So obviously, like the one picture of me teaching English, uh, I, they will never forget the word duck because they couldn't figure out what duck was. So I just went, wah, wah. No, so now they know what duck is. <laughs> I'm a teacher. But there, it was just the beginning of a few words of English, and they, they don't really get much at that level. Yeah, yeah. Do we have any more time? Can I just ask you one question? We'll, we'll squeeze one more. Uh, were the Christian churches Coptic churches? Because when I was in the Middle East, uh, the oh oldest God. Christian churches, they were Coptic. Um, I don't know, but I don't believe so. No, the, the, one, um, the one across the street from this family, there it, we don't have a picture of it, but I think it was, uh, I think it was Roman Catholic. Yeah, they're mostly Catholic. All right. Yeah. Thank you very much for coming.